So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Hopefully that's not too loud. That sounds really loud to me. Um, I'm Dr. Becky Lynn. I am a gynecologist. I run Ebor Women's Health in St. Louis. I'm also, I'm going to take this off while I'm up here. I'm also an adjunct associate professor of OBGYN at St. Louis University. So not too far from here. And um, I'm really grateful that I get to come speak at this conference. This is definitely an interest of mine. Um, I'll give you a little background, how I ended up being the marijuana doctor, which is just not what I thought I was going to end up being. Um, but uh, I specialize in sexual problems in women, so low libido, painful sex. Um, and I noticed back in 2015 that a lot of my patients were coming to me with low libido, painful sex, difficulty with orgasm. And they'd say, no, if I use marijuana, I, I'm fine. And so it sparked my interest. Um, I went to the medical literature to see what the data showed. I'm definitely an acad academician, and I'm like, I want, I want the evidence, of which there was very limited evidence. Most of it was in a rat meeting, all the little you know mating rituals, hops and darts, and things they do, and, and really not any high quality evidence in humans. Duh, because you can't give people marijuana and say go have sex because it's illegal. So. Um, or definitely was more legal. Yeah. Um, so, and I went to the internet, and all over the internet it said marijuana is an aphrodisiac, marijuana does this. Um, and so at St. Louis University, we designed a study looking at women's perceptions of the sexual experience when they used cannabis um, before sex. So I'll get to that at the end. But in doing that, it sort of opened up a lot of doors. Now, um, I'm you know, I'm looking at cannabis and how it treats pain, especially pelvic pain and sexual pain and endometriosis. So, so that's how I kind of got into the space and it's been really fascinating. So um, I'm just gonna run through my talk here and I'll Okay, so um, go figure, the female reproductive system has the highest concentration of endocannabinoid uh, receptors after the brain. So, you know, it's, it, the endocannabinoid system plays a huge role in all things female-related. So periods, ovulation, um, menstruation, um, fertility, pregnancy, it's just, there's, there's so many of the cannabinoid receptors in the female re reproductive tract that, um, you know, we, I, I didn't learn any of this in residency or medical school. Nobody ever talked about it. And so I feel like we opened the door to the role, understanding the role of endocannabinoids, but also possibly using cannabinoids therapeutically. So I'm just going to run through the basic science, the endocannabinoid system, which I'm sure you're all pretty familiar with. Um, we'll talk about the difference between endocannabinoids and cannabinoids, and then I've chosen to talk about um, cannabinoids and the menstrual cycle, fertility, pregnancy, uh, gynecologic pain, and sexual function. So the endocannabinoid system is a cell signaling system um, identified just here in the early 1990s um, by researchers who, you all know this, I'm sure, <laughs> researchers who uh, who characterized the molecular structure of cannabis. So then they had to figure out um, what does that cannabis bind to? So then they found the receptors for it. Um, and so then you're like, why is there even a receptor in the human body? What is the endogenous ligand? So what in the body actually binds to that receptor? So what are endocannabinoids? So we, you know, because we found uh, the molecular structure of cannabis, which then we found the receptor, we looked for the endocannabinoids, and we found several. Um, endocannabinoids are compounds that our bodies naturally produce to allow cells uh, to communicate with one another. So they send messages, they tell cells to do things, um, and they bind to the cannabinoid receptors. And so what does the endocannabinoid system do? It maintains a steady state of internal condition, so it's, it maintains homeostasis. So if you, um, Think of what homeostasis is. It's a balance. It keeps things calm. So there's two uh, good analogies that I like to use to describe this. 
One is, you know, that we use CBD for seizures, and a seizure is like an electrical impulse that's traveling down neurons and firing, firing, firing. So when you're having a seizure, that nerve is firing, and um, you want it to stop. You want it to bring it back to its basal state, um, and so that's that's the role of the endocannabinoid system is to kind of calm it down and bring it back to its basal state. So that's it, it's oversimplified how CBD works. Um, but also, if you think about um, your body's response to heat, so let's say you go outside and you're really hot and sweat, well, what happens there? So the endocannabinoid system is responsible for detecting that you're hot, so then it tells your blood vessels, it sends messages amongst cells, which form tissues, tells your blood vessels to come to the surface of the skin, to release heat, to sweat, and all that, so it wants to bring your temperature back into that tightly controlled range that balance so you don't um, overheat. So that's the role of the endocannabinoid system. It's made up of a variety of components. These are you know, by no means the only components, but the main ones are anandamide and 2-AG. I'm not even gonna try and pronounce that. Um, and there are others. And then there are enzymes that are part of the endocannabinoid system that are involved in making them and breaking them down. So they have to come from somewhere. Enzymes uh, play that role. So the two main enzymes in the endocannabinoid system are FAAH and MAGL. And then the two main receptors are CB1 and CB2. Okay, so how does a receptor work? So this picture here, let me see, maybe you can't see that. So this like green, green outline, or red, this is a cell, and then that green outline, that's the cell membrane. And then these little orangey things um, are molecules that bind to receptors, which are the long green things in the cell membrane, and they send a signal into the cell to tell it to do something. So, um, so these receptors are surface molecules. They bind to your endogenous, and by endogenous, I mean what your body naturally makes, endogenous cannabinoid molecules, and they trigger changes in cell behavior. But also exogenous, or outside the body, cannabis, um, or other cannabinoids will bind to that same receptor. And the cannabinoid receptors are found all over in the body. Um, the main ones, CB1, CB2, CB1 is mostly found in the brain and the nervous system, and CB2 is mostly located in immune organs, spleen, tonsils, the thymus, immune cells, um, and distributed throughout the body. Okay, so like I mentioned at the beginning, there are a lot of cannabinoid, endocannabinoid receptors in the female reproductive tract. And I think it's up to scientists now to figure out what role are they playing in reproduction um, and what are they doing there. And we still do not, we by no means have a complete understanding of what the endocannabinoid system is doing in uh, the reproductive tract. So just a couple of things. Um, just to point out, when I talk, when you say cannabinoids, there's a variety of different types of cannabinoids. So there's your natural cannabinoids, like CBD and, and the cannabis plant, natural. There are synthetic cannabinoids, which bind to the CBD receptor, but they're made in a lab. So these are like nabalone, dronabinol. They're not natural. You don't find them in a plant. Um, and then endocannabinoids, 2-AG and anandamide, that your body makes on its own. Um, and like I mentioned, the cannabis contains many cannabinoid molecules that act like your own natural endocannabinoids. And so that opens doors to use exogenous cannabinoids as medicines. And there's other receptors that cannabinoids bind to also, um, so they may also work their magic through the serotonin receptor. Um, serotonin is another, it's a neurotransmitter in your brain. When you think of like Prozac, Zoloft, that group of antidepressants, they also work through serotonin, but it does a lot more than that. So this is kind of what I alluded to before, the history, how we got to um, finding these receptors, so I'm not gonna repeat it here. But let's move on to um, the diff what we know about the different um, reproductive functions um, and how cannabis and cannabinoids affect that. So we'll start with the menstrual cycle. 
So the menstrual cycle is regulated by the brain. So women, well, everybody has a hypothalamus. Um, it's part of your brain, and it makes GnRH, which is gonadotropin-releasing hormone. So that's that GnRH. And that GnRH travels to your pituitary gland, also in your brain, and it makes your pituitary gland make LH and FSH, which is a luteinizing hormone and, follic and follicle-stimulating hormone. And those two hormones travel to your ovaries, and they get your ovary to grow a group of eggs each month. Um, and then one egg wins, and it pops out of the ovary, and it travels down the fallopian tube, and it either gets fertilized or not fertilized. And if it's not fertilized, then you have a period. And during that time, there's a variety of hormones that are made. So when we look at the menstrual cycle, we divide it into two phases, the follicular phase and the luteal phase. The follicular phase is, um, and just we'll say about a 28-day cycle, not everybody has that. The follicular phase is the first 14 days, and the luteal phase is the second 14 days. And the hormones that your ovaries make vary throughout the menstrual cycle. So you can see that in the beginning, estrogen is kind of going up, but progesterone is really high in the luteal phase. So what about the effects of cannabinoids on the menstrual cycle? So this is exogenous cannabinoids. Um, and studies in animals show that cannabis affects ovulation. So that ovulation is delayed or doesn't happen at all. Um, and remember, these are animal studies. So one thing, I, one point I want to make, and I make it later in the talk too, is that you can't always take the animal study and say, oh, it's exactly the same in humans, because it is so much more complex. Um, so, but in animal studies, ovulation is delayed or doesn't happen at all. Um, and the way that we found this works is, is that the cannabinoids decrease the release of GnRH. So you can see like the blue X up there, that's where it works. That's where the, that's how, that's the location in this whole cascade where cannabinoids affect the menstrual cycle. And if you don't ovulate, it means you don't have a period and there's no possibility of pregnancy. So cannabinoids in animals can disrupt the menstrual cycle. Not to scare you, but. Um, and of course we do, um, it's kind of sad because that monkey's very cute, but you know we, we need to keep going with science. But um, we use rhesus monkeys a lot to study the menstrual cycle because their menstrual cycle is very similar to ours. And so in, in one study here, in rhesus monkeys, they injected THC, pure THC, so not cannabis, not you know all of the, everything else that are in cannabinoids, but just THC, the equivalent of five to six joints during the first half of the menstrual cycle, and that delayed or prevented ovulation. But in a longer term study, the impact of THC in ovulation in the rhesus monkeys appeared to go down over time, so a tolerance developed and then ovulation returned to normal in those monkeys. But the data in humans is so much less clear. And you know, the, the one thing about science with cannabis and cannabinoids is we have not been able to do a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial on women and, and look at what their menstrual cycle does. Um, so um, it's hard to, to collect data on that, you sort of have to do it retrospectively or observationally. So cannabis in humans, um, it has been associated with a longer, longer follicular phase. It's in hormone levels, when they looked at the frequency um, of cannabis use when comparing users to non-users. One study, I thought this was kind of interesting, um, 28 adult female humans showed that the menstrual cycle phase had no effect on marijuana-induced changes in subjective ratings of intoxication and confusion. So, you know, where you were in your menstrual cycle, your menstrual cycle kind of affects a lot when you're a woman, um, and where you are in your cycle, it didn't change how cannabis affected you, basically. And there are two human studies that show no effect on progesterone or estrogen levels, those, those hormones that your ovaries make, whereas in rhesus monkeys, those were affected. 
Another um, important thing to note about the reproductive hormones and cannabis um, is that both estrogen and progesterone affect how cannabis works in your body. So estrogen enhanced the ability of cannabis to lessen pain. And these are all animal studies. Um, it did not affect the slowing of movement. I haven't mentioned testosterone, but your ovaries make testosterone as well. And when testosterone was around, it lessened cannabis-induced slowed movements, whereas progesterone induced tolerance to cannabis. So these are typically studies where they take mice and they take the ovaries out and they give them THC and look at what happens. And then sometimes they'll replace the hormones where they get like the same level of hormones every day instead of fluctuations. Um, but so, so the, the take home point of these studies is that there's a bi-directional effect. Um, so estrogen and progesterone affect cannabis, but cannabis affects estrogen and progesterone in animal studies. So the problem with animal studies is that animals are really different from humans. I mean, compare us to a mouse, we're really different. Um, and the other thing about animal experience is their fear experiments, they're very well controlled. So, you know, they take just the specific THC and inject it. So they know the exact dose, the exact route, and they, there's different routes that they use in mice. Sometimes they inject it into their brain. Um, you know, and they know the exact timing of when it was injected. And that's not really how humans use cannabis, right? And, and the cannabis that they're getting is not pure tea. Um, the other issues with the animal studies, you can't measure the exact amount, the strain, the dose. And the human studies are a lot of times questionnaires. And these are based on recall, based on what people remember. So there's a huge inherent bias in that. That's not very objective, it's very subjective. And human studies tend to be small studies. So there's not huge randomized trials, um, thousands of women. Um, and small studies will have you know, maybe like 10 or 15 participants. Um, and then because they're small, then maybe another study comes along that's similar but slightly different. So you get conflicting reports. So it's hard to know what to think. So it's a start, but we need more research. Um, a couple other things that are difficult to control in humans when you look at the menstrual cycle is think of all the different things that affect the menstrual cycle that have nothing to do with cannabinoids. So stress, right? Women who are under stress, sometimes their periods go away. It affects their hypothalamus and that GnRH. Um, your weight. So very morbidly obese women uh, will sometimes develop polycystic ovarian syndrome and not ovulate, and weight loss. So um, a lot of times when women rapidly lose weight or they get very thin or anorexic, their periods go away. Um, and then the other thing about human studies, the list goes on, right? I can talk about this for a long time, is that you can't control uh, in those studies for other lifestyle behaviors. So the use of other drugs like tobacco, um, you know, that always complicates your results. So you have to keep that in mind when looking at human studies. So let's talk about fertility. What do we know about cannabinoids and fertility? So this is how conception works. Maybe you, you know, heard this before, um, but every month um, your ovaries grow a group of eggs. They all, they get bigger and bigger and one wins and it pops out. And if you're gonna have twins, two pop out and they travel down the fallopian tube. And if they're fertilized by a sperm, they usually meet in the fallopian tube and combine, that's where that happens. And then that embryo will travel to the uterus and implant. So there's a lot of cell signaling that has to go on to make that work correctly. If it's not fertilized, then the egg is just shed with the lining of the uterus um, or the endometrium each month. So what do we know about this whole process in cannabinoids? So I'm gonna shift a little bit. I've been talking mostly on the menstrual cycle about exogenous cannabinoids and that effect on the menstrual cycle. But here's what we know about endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids and fertility. So we know that the ovary makes anandamide, which is one of the big endocannabinoids. 
and that the anandamide plays a role in growing ovarian follicles so that when I mentioned each month, the hormones like estrogen tell your ovaries to grow those follicles, those, you know, maybe 20 or so eggs. Um, and we know that anandamide plays a role in that. So it's not just estrogen. There's a lot of cell signaling that has to go on whoops, to make that work correctly. So anandamide plays a role. It also plays a role in transporting an embryo down the fallopian tube towards the uterus. So a lot has to happen for that embryo to actually make it to the uterus. Um, and anandamide plays a role in that. The endocannabinoid system plays a role in implantation of the embryo into the uterus. I mean, think about, it just brings home the point that like it's amazing that anybody ever gets pregnant and stays pregnant when there's so many different areas that can be affected. Um, and implantation depends on having the right amount of anandamide in the uterus. And anandamide levels, what they do is they increase up to the point of ovulation, much like estrogen does. Um, so we think that they play a role, that anandamide uh, plays a role in ovulation. Um, but what about the embryos themselves? So the embryo, once you combine the egg and the sperm, which will eventually become an embryo, um, they have endocannabinoid receptors also. So this new human that you're forming, that embryo, or ball of cells that becomes a person, um, has endocannabinoid receptors. So when those endocannabinoid receptors are working right or something happens, um, then you, it might lead to miscarriage. Um, so women who have recurrent miscarriages, there are some women who just can't carry pregnancy. It's really awful. They'll be pregnant like nine times. They get pregnant easily, but then they miscarry every time. There must, there might be something in the endocannabinoid system that's not functioning right. The endocannabinoid system, the endocannabinoids and those receptors and everything, and the enzymes are also found in the human placenta. Um, so they may, so we, so endocannabinoids may play a role in disorders like preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is um, sort of that hypertensive disorder of pregnancies when they get really high blood pressures, and it's actually it's very dangerous. And when they die from it, they can have abruption or seizures. And preeclampsia is caused by something in the placenta. then it could play a role in preeclampsia. We don't know for sure. These are all like, you know, postulates, maybe theories. Um, but I feel like we have our work ahead of us to figure out exactly what's going on. And also the endocannabinoid system does affect a woman's, woman's risk for ectopic pregnancies. So there's one study that I read I have to think back for now where they did, um, they had women with ectopic pregnancies and they did a biopsy of the fallopian tube and then they had women who were having surgery for some other reason and didn't have ectopic pregnancies. And um, they did biopsy of the fallopian tube and they found that women with ectopic pregnancies had, I can't remember the exact, but maybe like different amount of cannabinoid receptors. So what happens if somebody uses external cannabinoids? We don't really know, and there's mixed reports. So one study showed that it didn't really make a difference. Um, so no increase in time to pregnancy in women who use cannabis. Other studies didn't say that, and they said uh, reduced ability to reproduce. Um, so its effect on the ability to conceive cannabis, exogenous cannabis, cannabis we just, we don't know. As far as miscarriage goes, one study showed high levels of anandamide were found in the blood of women who miscarried compared to those who didn't. Another study showed that women who were prone to miscarriage had higher blood levels of anandamide than those who did not. But another study showed no difference in anandamide levels in women who miscarried compared to women who did not miscarry. So the jury's still out. So I've talked a lot about disruptions, what, you know, exogenous cannabinoids can do, are cannabinoids bad and endocannabinoids good? No. Um, and there, I'll get to it when I get to the sexual function and the pain. Um, there are so, what I think, personally, there are so many benefits to cannabinoids and that they're likely going to have a very therapeutic role in the future 
Um, but because this is women's health, I have to talk about pregnancy and lactation. So I'm gonna talk about that first. Um, so with that said, I don't recommend cannabis to women when they're pregnant or lactating. And the reason is there's just not enough data to say that it's safe. So when it comes to pregnancy, I don't recommend it. Now, there are a lot of women who use cannabis for nausea in pregnancy, and it seems to work. Um, and so if you came to me, I would have to say, no, don't use it. But as with anything in medicine and any drugs, all medicines have risks, benefits, and side effects. Every medicine has a risk to it. So the woman has to look at what do we know, what do we not know, look at the risks, look at the benefits, do the benefits outweigh the risks, and look at her own situation. Um, but the American College of OBGYN, which is our governing body, recommends against using cannabis in pregnancy or lactation. And they actually have um, an article that summarizes the data on that, um, and I'll, I'll go through that. I already talked about this. So here's what we know. So THC crosses the placenta, which means it gets to the baby. Not everything can cross the placenta. Like insulin doesn't cross the placenta because it's a really big molecule. But THC crosses the placenta, so the baby sees it. And fetal blood levels are about 10% of maternal blood levels after exposure. But if mom uses it on a regular basis, the fetal blood levels are higher. It's difficult to assess its effects on pregnancy because people who use cannabis might also be tobacco smokers or using other drugs. And I feel like in our training as OBGYNs, talking about cannabis with pregnant women has been the hardest because we can say, don't use cocaine because it causes placental abruption, which is where the placenta shears off the side of the uterus, it's an obstetrical emergency, it's horrible. difficult, I think, because you don't have a concrete, do cocaine, you'll have an abruption, don't do it. Um, so that's kind of my perception of where we have been. I've been, I've been in OBGYN for 20 years and, and, you know, how we talk to patients about cannabis. The other thing about cannabis is that uh, marijuana smoke contains many of the same toxins as tobacco smoke. So when you're pregnant, we don't want you to smoke cigarettes for those reasons, um, you know, because cigarettes have toxins. And women who smoke in pregnancy and want to quit can use a nicotine patch. It's really the toxins that we're worried about. So that goes for marijuana too. Um, so what does ACOG, American College of OBGYN, say? Studies in animals show that using cannabis during pregnancy disrupts normal brain development and function. There does not seem to be an association between cannabis use in pregnancy and the risk of dying after birth. And the risk of stillbirth may be modestly increased. Remember, all of these are confounded by other a very small baby. Um, and so the question you have to ask about that is that were they tobacco smokers? Because women who smoke tobacco tend to have smaller babies also. And even though it sounds better, because if you're the woman who's pregnant, you don't want a massive baby when you go to deliver, smaller babies when they're pathologically small, have less blood flow coming from the placenta, so it's not really a good thing. Fetal cannabis exposure can make the effects of alcohol on brain development worse. Studies noted that children whose mothers used cannabis had lower scores on tests of visual problem solving, visual motor coordination, and visual analysis than kids who didn't get exposed. Um, and it's also been associated, so that's an association, not causation, um, with decreased attention span and behavioral problems. And the effects of cannabis on school, um, how well you do in school, are much less clear. It's all unclear, really. Um, so there's a lot of limitations to the data um, on marijuana use in pregnancy. Like I mentioned, we're not animals, so a lot of the studies come from animal studies. Um, and just so many things play a role. Like if you look at, okay, so you test school performance at age five, think of all the things that could have affected school performance between the time the baby was born and to age five. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of limitations to our data and a lot of that has to do with that. We can't, well, nobody, we can't, I wouldn't say nobody, but we don't do studies on pregnant women specifically. 
let alone federal, like we you can't do those in the United States um, because it's federally illegal, illegal. So basically what ACOG says is women who are pregnant or contemplating pregnancy should be encouraged to stop using marijuana. Um, and they should also um, not use it with breastfeeding because we just don't know. We just don't know. There's not enough data to evaluate the effects of marijuana use on infants, how much marijuana gets into the breast milk and gets transferred to the infant. So we just don't know, so we don't recommend it. Okay, now for the fun stuff. This is where my interest lies. Um, we're gonna talk about pelvic pain. So in my practice, I focus on um, sexual problems in women, and one of those is painful sex. So that's kind of how I fell into the pain realm. Um, and uh, so what do we know about cannabis? I use cannabis and marijuana interchangeably. I, when I say them, I, I mean the same thing. Cannabinoids treat chronic pain. Like, there is no question about this. There is good data to support the use of cannabis for pain, or that it does work, that it's been shown to work. Um, and it dampens the body's pain-inducing response to injury. So we know that in general. Um, and we know that uh, THC acts like the natural endocannabinoids, 2-AG and anandamide, and these modulate the pain response in the brain. So there's a lot that has to happen when somebody has pain. You know, let's say you step on a nail, it, you feel that on your toe or wherever, and it travels via nerves up to your spinal cord, up to your brain, and then your brain modulates how you hear pain. So when we talk about somebody's pain tolerance, basically your brain might send a signal down going, oh, that's not so bad. And other people, like people with fibromyalgia, the brain will be like, oh my gosh, that pain is horrible, even though it's the same stimulus. So we know that um, the endocannabinoids modulate pain responses in the brain. So maybe THC is working through that mechanism. It also might lessen the side effects of THC, um, maybe not as much of a high, rapid heart rate, anxiety. Um, and other components have anti-pain properties too, so terpenoids, flavonoids, um, also can have uh, analgesic properties. And this is a life-altering condition that some women have, and they develop chronic pain. So basically what endometriosis is, it's endometrial tissue, which is the tissue that you shed each month. So the uterine lining is the endometrium and it's found outside the uterus. So it can be implanted on the ovaries, on the bowel, on the bladder, and it causes severe pelvic out of 10 women. So if you think about, you know, for every 10 people you know, or every 10 women you know, um, there's, you know, at least one of them that has terrible pain <laughs> due to endometriosis. And endometriosis classically causes painful sex. That's one of its, you know, telltale signs. But it can also cause pain with bowel movements. It's harming or it's really bad menstrual cramps. Um, it can also cause pain not related to menstrual cramps. Um, and we don't know exactly what causes endometriosis, but there's been some research looking at how the endocannabinoid system can actually be So you can see here the picture on the right, that's the uterus that you're looking at. It's almost as if somebody chopped you off and you were looking down into a pelvis. You can see all those little like purple, the darker areas. That's endometriosis um, and associated scarring. Whereas on the left is that nice big pink round thing, that's the uterus. And then the things coming off the side are fallopian tubes and ligaments. So when it comes to pain, there are three types of pain mechanisms, nociceptive, inflammatory, and neuropathic. So nociceptive is like if you put your finger in a flame, it hurts because there's damage to the tissue. Um, inflammatory is your body's natural response to injury. So inflammation can be good and it can be bad. Inflammation can bring all the you know, necessitating, 
necessary nutrients to an area that's been injured, but we also know inflammation, like look at the cytokine storm in COVID, right? You know, that's all this overreaction of inflammation. Neuropathic, um, or neuropathic pain, this is uh, damage to the neurons that send the signals to your brain telling you that there's pain. And then there's also called something called central sensitization, um, which I, I was in one of the talks earlier, and um, Dr. Annabelle was talking about neuroplasticity. And so basically, it's kind of central sensitization is kind of like your brain can hear pain really loud if something keeps happening to tell your brain. You still feel that foot because those other neurons that send that signal up to your brain, they're still telling you it's there, even though it's not. So um, what do we know about endometriosis and the endocannabinoid system? So women with endo have been found to have different levels of endocannabinoids in their blood than women without endometriosis. Um, we know that the endocannabinoid system uh, may play a role in other pain syndromes like migraines, fibromyalgia is a huge one. Um, and there is one theory that was put out there by Ethan Russo um, about endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. So the thought is that women who have an endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome don't have the right amount of endocannabinoids um, to control their pain. And it's much like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So if you have any familiarity with those, Parkinson's is a deficiency in the neurotransmitter dopamine, and Alzheimer's is a deficiency in the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. And neurotransmitters are just cell signaling things that tell cells to do things. Um, so so maybe women with endo just don't have enough endocannabinoids. So total theory, but I find it interesting. And we also know endo pain is partially due to inflammation and that cannabinoids decrease the release of inflammatory modulators, so they lower inflammation. The other thing is cannabinoids inhibit the growth of new blood vessels. And if you're growing a lesion of endometriosis, they need blood vessels to grow because the blood vessels bring nutrients and oxygen. Growth of these new blood vessels, and maybe that's why cannabinoids, maybe that's one of the mechanisms by which cannabinoids can lessen pain due to endo. Um, there are a couple trials looking at treating symptoms of endo with PEA, which is a, a modulator, so it affects the endocannabinoid system. And my personal opinion is cannabinoids or cannabinoids accepted, and it's about endometriosis pain. It's a review, so if anybody's interested, um, it's a review looking at what we know about um, endometriosis and chronic pelvic pain and the endocannabinoid system. Um, not out yet. I kind of talked about this already. So this study, um, this I thought was interesting. This study showed that women rated cannabis as the most effective self-management strategy in endometriosis pain. And so where I am in St. Louis, uh, Missouri legalized medical marijuana, I guess 2019, 2018, yeah, 2018. Um, and they've actually been really slow, partly due to COVID, to get dispensaries open. But I have a couple patients who have chronic pain due to endometriosis that cannabis seems to really, 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 really help them. So I'm going to turn to cannabinoids and uh, sexual function in women um, and what we know. And like I said, that's how I got involved in all of this space. So sexual function in women is very complex. We always think it's due to your testosterone. sexual function. So you can see like desire, excitement, orgasm, all the different hormones and the different neurotransmitters that play a role in having a normal sex life. And there's this theory, it's called the dual control model um, of sexual dysfunction, 
that says that it's kind of a balance of excitatory neurotransmitters and hormones versus inhibitory neurotransmitters and hormones. Um, so dopamine is stimulatory, excitatory, makes you want to have sex, um, and serotonin is not, and that's that's kind of why people on those SSRIs, Prozac, Zoloft, um, Celexa, all of those have, sometimes have low libido and difficulty reaching orgasm because of the serotonin, how it affects their serotonin is inhibitory. The release of serotonin and dopamine from neurons. So when you look at that balance there, um, it affects that balance. Um, and also, like we mentioned when we looked at the menstrual cycle, um, that it affects the hypothalamus, um, pituitary gonadal axis, so the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the ovary. So, um, so it, it messes with the reproductive hormones too, estrogen, which play the role, and your ovaries make testosterone too, so that can be affected as well. This is that hypothalamic pituitary um, axis again. Um, okay, so what do we know about sex? So we did at um, St. Louis University, we did a review, which if you're interested, on cannabinoids and sexual Search Lynn, my last name, and cannabis, female sexual function, you'll find it. Um, but we looked at all the studies that were out there, and they're not many. And so we divided them into animal studies and human studies. And here's kind of what we found. So in animals, several studies show an increase in, in receptivity as measured by more doses, and proceptivity, I'll explain this in a minute, as measured by courting when you give rats straight THC. So lordosis is this kind of like lifting of her bottom, and that signals in the rat world that she's interested in having sex. Um, and then, um, so we measure that as a, as we, we use that as a surrogate marker for receptivity. And then proceptivity, rats apparently do hops and darts and they make little vocalizations um, when they're trying to attract the mate. So, um, According to the animal studies, what they show is that THC is mostly beneficial in rats um, to sexual domains like desire, um, and, but, we, but when you use other, um, uh, other cannabinoids like synthetic ones, other exogenous cannabinoids and natural ones, um, you got mixed results. So really it was the THC that actually seemed to have a positive effect on rat sex and rat mating. What about human studies? So human studies are mostly based on questionnaires. So here's what we found. And it's so compounded by like, maybe you were in an argument with your partner. So, you know, there's just so many things that play a role. So you kind of have to take the questionnaire with a little bit of a grain of salt because there's so many confounding factors. So in the human studies, there was one back in 1974 that showed that the effects of marijuana appear to be dose dependent. So most of the time, marijuana had a positive effect, but if you use too much marijuana, then it had a negative effect, which makes total sense. If you use too much and you're, you can't move, then obviously that can be detrimental to a normal sexual episode. Um, we also found, or not we, but some know, um, increased mental and interpersonal contact with their sexual partner when people used marijuana, increased sensations, increased satisfaction when both partners were using. And remember, each questionnaire asked. And increases in both physiologic and subjective measurements of arousal um, were associated with decreases in serum endocannabinoids. So, so that's kind of interesting because most of the questionnaires, except for that last one, were looking at exogenous cannabinoids, looking at marijuana, um, and there seemed to be a positive effect. But this Klein, back in 2012, her experiment was different. She just measured what happens to your endocannabinoid levels when you were aroused. So she showed women sexy films and measured their endocannabinoids, and, and she found that they actually went down.
and of how marijuana affected the overall sexual experience. And then we broke it down into the domains of desire, orgasm, lubrication, and sexual pain. So um, this was done in um, a big OBGYN clinic. So any woman. But um, so they filled out the questionnaire. And women who reported using marijuana before sex at any time were then asked about their, the perceived effects of marijuana on the sexual experience. So we had 373 respondents, 197 were non users, um, 49 were users, but they didn't use it before sex. the majority of them reported an improvement in the overall sexual experience. And you can see that most of these were by a lot or a moderate amount. So 68.5% stated that the overall sexual experience was more pleasurable. 60.6% uh, noted an increase in sex drive. You can see mostly by a lot or a moderate amount. 52.8% reported an increase in satisfying orgasms. And um, a good percentage, the majority, also reported improvement in dyspareunia, which just means painful sex. And then this graph shows you by how much, so the magnitude of the positive impact. The blue colors are by a lot and by a moderate amount. So you can see that there's mostly the dark blue and the middle blue. Um, an increase in libido appears to be dose dependent at higher, libido, at higher doses, libido declines, like I mentioned. In our study, we also found that um, women, who, <clears throat> women who used marijuana frequently had a 2.1 times higher chance of reporting satisfactory orgasms in their general life, unrelated to marijuana. So, so why? Like, why is this happening? What, you know, that's the next question. Why does it seem to help? And it obviously doesn't help in everybody. Um, but maybe it decreases the anxiety surrounding sex, or it heightens sensations, or it slows down the perception of time. And I have to say that since we published this, I get so many questions about, well, do you tell all your patients to use marijuana before sex? No, I don't. You know, there's, 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 treatment in certain conditions and in certain situations, as long as you have an understanding of risks, benefits, side effects. And the other thing is that um, if you want to try this, don't try it in an unfamiliar situation with a, you know, sketchy partner. You know, first, if you want to try it, try it by yourself. That's like the safest place you could be. Or with a partner who you trust and you're in a safe space. So um, just to sum it up, the endocannabinoid system plays a role in menstruation and fertility, and um, exogenous cannabinoids can, infect, can affect menstruation. Cannabis crosses the placenta, so I don't recommend use in pregnancy and lactation. Um, several aspects of sexuality appear to be improved with cannabis and other studies using questionnaires have shown that too. Um, and endometriosis pain may be particularly susceptible to treatment with cannabinoids, and I'm just so looking forward to more data on that. So thank you very much for coming. Hopefully you found this um, interesting. Um, I'm huge on, I like to menopause and sexual health related, less about marijuana. Um, and there's my email up there if anybody needs to reach me on my website. So um, I'm more than happy to take questions, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>